Hoshka very much in Shaw, Kalasha Farsta, Jeremy Couple of Fokalas Gilligar, do so. Karja is more an honor to so Savan Shaw, not Augusta Gran or even the Touch of a Mosa Lake Ben Shaw, Tashi Puncha Lash and Changa, Gosri Mashan, the Sienta and Rod, and Nacht, go well kind on for the Chunahern the Man, the Star and Heron, Augustan Effort, eh, Yarfa, a V egg, eh, Namara, Sestrakal Janidan and Imperialis, Augustan Froster, a Hogshead, eh, Don Kiko Dunda, Augustumai, and Rolana, a Viaku. Eh, 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 it takes place here, so it's a it's a great thing that the uh, the venue is being used to tr try and explore the incredible influence on the central role, an important role that women had in the struggle uh, during the Irish Revolution, the struggle for trade unionism and the labour movement, and obviously the opposition uh, to the First World War and the role uh, the the activism of women uh, in order to attain their democratic right to vote. But uh, before we do anything else, can everyone please uh, turn off their phones and? Uh, and there's a, a reminder uh, regarding the books, the incredibly, uh, I was going to say cheap books, but that kind of cheapens the books. <laughs> the incredible offer there is in terms of books that we, we have a uh, half price books, so half the regular uh, retail price on the books. But uh, back to business here, we have three uh, brilliant speakers here tonight. And uh, the breakdown will be that each speaker will come to the podium and speak for 20 minutes. And as someone who's probably prone to going over the 20 minutes, I'll not be as tight as Brian Kelly was with me in the Lynn Hall Library. So uh, the first speaker tonight is Naive Neve Purcell. She's an historian and writer. She has written widely on Irish politics, history and the Labour movement. She's best known probably for her seminal work on the Irish Labour Party in 1822 to uh, 73, which is the standard history of the party and the best-selling landmark documents in Irish history. She is currently researching uh, a history of the Irish National Teachers' Organisation, of which I am a member, and we shall be going out on strike next Friday against the, what some people call the Tory cuts, but I would call the Stormont cuts. And uh, <coughs> so uh, Neve will be talking to us tonight. As well as this here, then we have uh, Mary Muldowney, so, uh, the, who's added a collection, The Legacy of the 1913 Lockout, 100 years later and is also the author of The Second World War and Irish Women in World History, and Trinity and its Neighbours in World History 2009, as well as many book chapters and journal articles using oral history interviews as our primary source. And we also have Sonia Tiernan and Shaw, uh, who got her thesis in UCD, was a fellow of the National Library of Ireland, Trinity College, and uh, I was going to say Notre Dame, but I think it's Notre Dame. Brian Thank Kelly, you. correct me there. So she currently lectures at Liverpool Hope University. Her speciality is modern Irish and British history, especially social history, crime and punishment, as well as gender and women's history. And she has recently completed a book on the political writings of the Irish author and trade union activist Eva Gore Booth, which is the third publication about the, the work of this prolific woman. She has also co-edited a volume of essays on gender and sexual politics in modern Ireland, which will be in print in April 2015. And she is currently writing the official history of the Marge Equality Campaign, and I think the book will await the outcome of the upcoming referendum. So without further ado, and Misha blathering on here, uh, we'll have this first speaker, who's uh, Neve Purcell, and uh, we'll all give a big bull of boss to no, Thank you very much for that, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming out on uh, a cold March uh, March evening like this. Um, I'm just going to say, um, sort of start off with a few words about. Uh, I think we're we're kind of taking it sort of chronologically, and I'm co going to begin at the the beginning or the prehistory and sort of um, take it from from the start there. But um, I suppose when uh, when a lot of us think about sort of the role of uh, women in the Great War, um, and the, the, the war is, uh, um, now let me see, sorry. That's Bill Gates being greedy and bringing out different versions of Microsoft Office. Um, 
I suppose it's worth sort of looking at um, when we look at uh, the the 1940 and 18 war, kind of what was happening beforehand, rather than sort of um, looking at uh, what what women were doing um, in in you know just the years of the war itself. And I suppose one of the things that um, is, is sort of worth bearing in mind is the extent to which women were becoming more active in politics and um, and in the society generally, and um, you know, coming coming to work more in terms of sort of uh, the numbers of women who were involved in teaching and nursing and um, more and more women working in shops or um, uh, working um, working in households as domestic servants and so on. So women were becoming more and more active anyway uh, before the war actually broke out. And I suppose one, one of the things that we would think about uh, primarily, I suppose, is um, the, the women's suffrage movement. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that when we, when we look at uh, women, the women's suffrage movement or the suffragettes, um, the, the kind of the level of activism and the level of militancy that we would have seen sort of in the years before the war actually broke out. And I think it's interesting if you look at um, what was happening in no the north at the time, uh, particularly in, um, in Belfast, there was a, a lot of militancy within, within the women or um, amongst the, the people who were looking for votes for women, there was a, a certain divergence between people who wanted to take a more militant kind of approach and people who were looking towards, um, uh, you know, sort of a more genteel way of looking at things. And um, the, the level of militancy that was, was kind of becoming evident in Belfast at the time, uh, with um, windows being smashed or, you know, um, that kind of thing. Uh, th here's a woman being arrested outside the mansion house in, in Dublin uh, for uh, protesting for, for votes for women. And when the war actually broke out, the, the suffrage movement would have, would have split um, between, some of them would have gone into to politics that was more kind of akin to what they would have gone for ordinarily. So people, women who were involved in unionist politics who, who wanted votes for women, um, some of them would have supported the war effort in the same way women who were involved in, um, in uh, the, rest of, uh, the rest of the state. But one of the things that the Irish Citizen was, uh, which was one of the, the main um, forum for, for, um, for women's suffrage, was, went for a very pacifist kind of a, a point of view. So rather than sort of um, supporting the war effort in any shape or form, it was regarded as being um, war for uh, war for um, for for uh, imperial countries, and it was regarded as as a very aggressive sort of a thing. And the kind of approach that um, people around the Irish citizen would have taken, and most famously, um, that would have been Frank Sheehy Skeffington and um, his wife Hannah Sheehy Skeffington. Um, was just an approach which was against the war itself rather than sort of um, taking, uh, taking on any kind of um, a view on it in terms of sort of supporting either our Germany or, or, or England. But one of the things with it was that it was, um, it was a case where uh, the suffrage movement was against uh, the, um, the idea of, of fighting in the war at all. Um, <clears throat> There were more militants outside of it, and I suppose this this next poster you've probably seen all of these posters already before they're kind of um this is the view that is kind of shown in terms of uh uh the the kind of um recruiting kind of thing that when when war broke out in um in august of nineteen fourteen there's lots of pictures of um sort of women calling men to the front, and that's one of the kind of um appeal to their sort of uh, their masculinity and sort of saying you know protect protect women in in Belgium but also you know do it for the women at home they'll sort of think better of you if you're if, if you're um, involved in it so I mean one of the the image in the middle there is very much sort of um, uh, Ireland as a woman 
Uh, but the rest of them are very much kind of the, the damsel in distress and an appeal to, to men's masculinity to say, you know, go to the front, sign up and, and, and do this because you're not a proper man if you, if, if you don't go and, and sort of help the women out. And I suppose one of the ways to counteract that then in a, in a kind of a gender sort of a way um, is to, to suggest then that um, the, the opposite is the actual case. So it's, um, this, is, this here is a, a leaflet from um, the Limerick Young Ireland Society um, and it's uh, a branch of Cumin and Ale, um, not Cumin and Ale as the later Cumin and Ale, but anyway. Um, so you can read it, it's, it's, um, it's using um, a quote from, um, from a priest on the subject, but it's basically saying it's, it's not only treason in Ireland, but it's, um, it's also basically saying that if you, if you fight in the war, if you sign up, um, you're, you're basically involved in something which is, um, which is kind of dirty, it's filthy in a sort of a, a moral kind of a way. Um, and they talk about um, what happens if you, if you sign up for the army, um, that you're bringing a plague of idleness, drunkenness, vulgarity and immorality in the purest Irish community. So this is an appeal basically to say to men that rather than, you know, it's, if you go and fight in the war, you're not actually sort of improving your masculinity. You're being, you know, you're doing something which is actually kind of pretty, uh, um, it's against God's will, it's immoral, it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, and that was one of the ways of, of going about it. I mean, when you look at the kind of the pull factors for why a man might join the army, apart from the idea of uh, going over and, um, you know, doing it for, for Little Belgium or um, with the volunteers, the suggestion that, you know, if you go and fight in the war, um, it will lead to Irish independence. Or for many, many of the, you know, you will have heard this over recent weeks, but the, 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 financial uh, benefits of signing up for for men for particularly say in Dublin who have been in, involved in the lockout in 1913 and you've got people who are um, really really they're destitute they have no income coming in and what you say to someone is you know if you go and fight in the war you have a, a steady income coming in and we'll also give um, we'll give money to your family um, and money for the children and everyone will be better off. So there's a, an economic kind of a pull factor and then there's sort of a moral and political one. So um, one of the ways of sort of trying to stop people from recruiting then is to appeal to um, uh, their kind of, uh, their sense of, of patriotism and uh, their sense of kind of masculinity. So in Ian Naharan, uh, who have been around from the turn of the century uh, were some of the people who were involved in uh, anti-recruitment campaigns. And one of the things that, like, one of the things with the, the First World War is when it broke out, there wasn't an anticipation that it was going to be anything like the war that it turned out to be. So when, when the war broke out, it was, it was obviously a big deal but it wasn't what we see now when we think of the Great War. And so it was almost as though the people who had been involved in anti-recruitment before kept doing what they used to do. So these women would have been involved in trying to stop men from joining the British Army and the Royal Navy for, um, for a very long time. They'd been involved in anti-recruitment for the last 14 years before the actual war broke out. And this was just a thing that they did and they continued doing that. And they did it by um, one of the things I have. Um, th this, is, this is a leaflet that, that, used to, that was handed out to, um, to people or to, to women in, uh, in Dublin. Um, by members of Inni Naharan. And the idea was basically that um, to stop women from hanging around with soldiers. Um, there was on, on, on Dublin's O'Connell Street, there were two sides of the street, obviously. And there was one side of the street where respectable people walked, and that was the side of those of you who know 
sort of Dublin well, it's the, the Cleary side of the street. And so the decent people walked on the Cleary side of the street and the soldiers and the soldiers' friends walked on the other side of the street outside the GPO. And women from Inne and the Heron would um, go along the, the, the GPO side of the street and they would um, try and encourage women to not fraternise with, um, with, uh, with the Tommies. Now, some of these women were, were, were young girls up from the country who, you know, just liked a man in uniform. And some of these women were professionals. Um, and so what Inne and the Heron used to do was, um, there's, there's an account here from um, Helena Maloney, who uh, later fought in, um, in, in, or was involved in 1916. And she, she recalls how a group of us would set out about eight o'clock in the evening and start from the Rotunda, Hot um, the Rotunda Hospital, uh, walking rapidly as far as the Bank of Ireland. Uh, we walked in two some 20 or 30 yards apart and managed to, in that way to paper the whole promenade before uh, these young people had time to grasp the contents of the handbill. So they used to just go along and they would send out these, these bills basically saying um, that, you know, no good Irish girl should be um, spending time, um, uh, the Irish girls who, who walk with Irish men wearing English, uh, England's uniform, remember you are walking with traitors. And they're basically sort of saying to them, you know, don't be, don't be hanging around with any of these people. Like it's, you know, um, you're you're bringing shame on yourself and on your family, and it's bad for Ireland. Uh, and they, they, you know, they, um, Helena Maloney remembers how the, the leaflets had to be concealed in handbags or or, um, or hand muffs, and delivered surreptitiously. So they'd sort of leaflet them, that sort of on the street, um, so that no one would be able to um, to see them. And um, and it was that kind of um, you know trying to uh, trying to discourage people by making it a kind of a, a, a socially unacceptable thing to do to be seen in um, in the company of a soldier or to you know um, try and uh, try and make it so that it was a complete taboo to go anywhere near one. And that was one of the things that Inni Naheran had done from from the outset was that like the the um, they would get the the children to sign a um, or t to pledge that they would never join the, the the army or the navy. And these were people who were you know trying to trying to get children from the outset to think that it was completely unacceptable. This here is um, is a leaflet that was put out by the Irish Citizen Army, um, which had been. Um, which was set up uh, during the lockout. But this is from the, the Belfast branch of the Citizen Army. And it's basically, uh, it came out around the time that the war had begun. And this is, this is one of the things to bear in mind. It says one of the, um, some people say that it will be over in a fortnight. So there's the idea that the war would be over by Christmas. And they say here that, um, they said the same about the Boer War, but it lasted three years. And the Boer War was a mere picnic compared to this, what this war will be. That's, you know, very sort of prophetic kind of statement. Um, so they're appealing to the women of Belfast and they're saying, you know, basically, Will you send your husband's father's sons or sweethearts to be slaughtered in defence of an empire that stood quietly by and allowed orange men to arm against you and against the freedom for Ireland? So they're putting it in very explicit kind of terms here. But the Citizen Army are a, a working class um, trade union affiliated um, organisation and they're very much involved in... Um, the kind of uh, radical kind of politics that Mary is going to be talking about here. Um, but I suppose the main thing to, to, to bear in mind with the early part of women's activism is that it's very much part of what they have been doing prior to, um, to 1914. That it's, um, it's part of um, the activism that they were involved in through the women's suffrage movement and through the trade union movement and through um, cultural nationalism. Um, and that it kind of keeps going um, in, in that kind of a way um, with people who are involved in this movement and, and in um, the kind of groups that Mary is going to talk about. So I'm gonna, I think I'm over time now. I'm gonna wrap it up there. Okay.
I can't see anything under my nose, but I can see right to the back without the glasses. Um, what I'm going to, to talk about, as Neve said, is uh, primarily the women who are in the labour movement, but who also were very involved in nationalist and republican politics, and who became extremely militant by being mainly members of the Irish Citizen Army. They also joined Common Amon, but that was set up as an auxiliary to the national volunteers, so it wasn't quite as militant as the Citizen an army where women could join as equals as their right. But in the photograph that you can kind of faintly see in the background there, that is that was taken in, I think, late 1915, and it shows members of both Common Amon and the Irish Citizen Army. I think the women in the uniforms are more likely to be the ICA women, and they uh, it would, would have been coming up towards serious planning for the uh, 1916 rising, even though it was sort of late in the previous year. Now, these are some of the key women who had a kind of a crossover involvement in opposition to the war, but also in uh, between suffragism and an interest in labor organizing. Some of them were pacifist anti-militarists, some of them were straightforward separatists, and some, like Mary Galway, uh, actually came before the war. Her kind of her main period of activity would have been leading up to the war. She was very well organized with the textile workers in the north uh, before the war, uh, but uh, she would have been very, very strongly unionist and didn't share a lot of the political aspirations of the other women, particularly those who came from the south. Winfred Carney, for instance, was uh, somebody who was working with the Textile Operative Society and then later the uh, Irish, uh, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union version of the textile operatives branch um, here in Belfast and then um, is more probably most famous for being James Connolly's secretary and staying with them to the very end of the surrender in the GPO in April 1916. But the main thing, one of the, the key debates about what was going on at that time was about organizing women for trade unions because, uh, as Neve has mentioned, the absolute state of just total defeat really was would have been the aftermath of the 1913 lockout. The incredible poverty that faced working class people in Belfast and Dublin and Derry and everywhere else uh, in Ireland. I mean, we, we talk about a huge disparity between the rich and the poor now, but it was really life or death in those days. And Louis Bennett was somebody who came from a fairly, you know, solid middle class background. She was well healed. She had an independent income. But she became involved with the labor movement. She was originally a suffragist, but she became involved with the labor movement because she helped out in Liberty Hall and around the organizing for the 1913 lockout. And what she saw then motivated her to realize that there was more than just getting women organized and that uh, even having the vote wouldn't be sufficient, that there could be no real uh, freedom and independence independence of women, as she says, until they're economically free. And of course, that was an enormous problem because much more 100 years ago, women were segregated in terms of the work they could do. It was institutionally unequal, even where they were doing similar work to men, but it was very limited in what they could do. And of course, they didn't have equal access to education. And uh, this was a huge problem. So Louis Bennett in uh, 1916, after Helena Maloney that uh, Neve has mentioned, um, she was a secretary of the Irish Women Workers Union, which had been founded in 1911. And Louis Bennett came in at James Connolly's request and took over, it was actually 1915, sorry, my dates are not always the strongest. Uh, but the, the key of what she's saying there is that the vote by itself wouldn't be sufficient. And this is something that was very much on the mind of Sissy Cahillan, who came from a working class background and was an organizer with the Irish Distributive and uh, a Drapers Assistance Association, which is a union that's now Mandate and its sister in the north is Usdal, but they represent primarily retail workers. 
And she is pointing out that in the industrial world that women really have to fight for themselves. And she got very frustrated with the kind of top-down approach that to some extent Bennett was advocating in that, you know, women could be organized and that uh, they would just need somebody to show them the way. She was saying that women themselves have to get out and do for themselves, so it would be a bottom-up approach to trade union organisation. And she said that they can't be doing that separately, they must do it in the Labour Parliament, which of course would be the Trades Councils, the, the Parliament of Labour, the representatives of the different unions. And she was one of the first women who was elected to the Irish Congress of Trade, the Trade Union Congress, uh, um, in the early years of the 20th century. And so she literally put her money where her mouth was, you know, that she was a leader in that sense, but she showed the way. But she was also a suffragist and very involved with some of the other women that uh, were active at that time. Now, there were constant bombardment of uh, propaganda. And Neve showed you some of the posters. Theories are just one or two more. And I've chosen these really in particular because they focus on particular aspects of work that women could do and that they were actually being encouraged to do. And the Women's Land Army was very important in that it was replacing men who had joined the armed forces with women doing work that previously they would have been discouraged from doing because it was hard manual labor. And they probably, you know, they were generally not considered suitable. Although, of course, lots of them would have been doing it for free for their families. But that never counts. Um, and, of course, munitions was very much the recruitment for that was totally focused on women because uh, it was figured that they wanted men to enlist. So most of the recruitment efforts in Britain, it was across the classes. In Ireland, and I've never seen an explanation for this from official sources, but it was focused almost exclusively on the hard slog in the factories being done by working class women. Middle class women, if they wanted to take jobs in munitions factories here, were encouraged into the admin and the offices and um, generally just didn't get the jobs because it wasn't nice. You know, you couldn't be mixing the classes. Uh, but at the same, you've got going on at the same time then another leaflet from the Irish Citizen Army where as I said women could join as equals but saying why men shouldn't enlist but also kind of a precursor to the recognition of economic conscription that so many working class men were joining up simply because it was a good source of income and I want to talk briefly about separation women in a, a few minutes because that was something that I think gives a good indicator of the kind of class attitudes that were uh, really taken by some of the most active women beyond the, I suppose, the nationalist stroke Republican side. I think more the Republican um, labels was more from, you know, slightly later period. At this stage, they would have called themselves nationalist. This is a, uh, a leaflet produced by the Irish Trade Union Congress. And it's focused on women. I have to see, remind myself what it says, but it says, you who will suffer most in this foreign war. Um, and it's putting, it's looking at women in that kind of maternalist context, you know, talking about, it is the sons you reared at your bosom that will be sent to be mangled and shot by shot and torn by shell. Your father's husbands and brothers whose corpses will pave the way to glory for an empire that despises you. But it goes on, you know, to point out the economic consequences for the war. And certainly, um, um, the economic consequences were felt fairly early on for working class people because the price of food went up, lots of other things happened for people who had already very low incomes or no income in many cases. It was fairly devastating. So it did have a further uh, push effect in encouraging men to enlist and women to encourage them to do it. Um, and to some, you know, to some extent, opposition to enlistment on a basis of principle was a luxury for people with higher incomes. <laughs> 
But Nellie Donnelly, who uh, was the sister of Grace Gifford, who married James Plunkett, one of the 1916 uh, signatories of the proclamation, in her uh, statement to the Bureau of Military History, which, from my own personal view, you know, um, Neve quoted uh, from Helena Maloney's statement, and I'm going to as well, but it's... The, the Bureau statements are fantastically revealing of all sorts of things that I think the witnesses didn't always realise that they were giving away, and some of it is about class. But in this case, she's talking about uh, using her own position to dissuade young working class men from enlisting by providing alternative forms of employment. And she was in a position to try and give them some alternative but as she said you know because she was using her father's house and he obviously got a bit fed up with it uh, she went to Madame Markovich and she just had access to uh, rooms in the Sinn Féin offices at the time and she describes later in the statement you know about Connolly being able to source work around the docks and that um, they clearly still had influence even despite the defeat in the lockout and of course the strike up here in 1907 but you know that that was another way of trying to keep young men at home and not have them enlist so while Gifford um, and Donnelly as she became were, had a, a you know a fairly anti-militarist pacifist point of view it was also very much in formed by her nationalism, that it was not accommodating the old enemy by keeping uh, young women uh, or young men out of the armed forces. And she, it, you know, it, it's a limited kind of statement. It's quite a short one that she gave, but clearly not any recognition that there might have been a problem with the whole system anyway. You know, it wasn't just the wartime conditions. These are some of the uh, jobs that women were involved in and that are kind of have given rise to uh, some historians' interpretation of the First World War that it was a time of great opportunity for women. Well, you know, maybe it was. <laughs> uh, certainly they got into jobs they wouldn't have been allowed into otherwise at uh, dilution wages, at in dangerous conditions, <laughs> in the munitions, in, you know, on doing really hard manual labour on the land. And of course, women were nursing at the front. But it was very much for the period of 1914 to 1918. And a lot of these women would have written afterwards about the sense of freedom that they had for the years of the war, despite the hardship of some conditions. And they were happy enough to be doing it because they wanted to break out of a lot of the chains. But equally, um, you know, it was made clear that it was always on a sort of temporary basis. And they, you know, those who were politically savvy were well aware that this was going to be the case. This, these are just some uh, photographs from the National Shell Factory in Dublin. And the reason that I'm particularly focusing on munitions was because it was so unfeminine, you know, and that would have been said at the time. And yet, uh, in Ireland, although um, it, it was fairly well regulated, it was government run for the most part, Mackey's factory here had um, a munitions plant where women were actually paid rather more than they might have been in the, you know, the previous work they were doing. Certainly it raised women's expectations expectations because they pay, got paid a lot more than the domestic work or other things they could have been doing. The problem was, of course, it was very definitely just for the war, and it was incredibly dangerous. You know, that uh, you're looking at the shells that they're stacking up there. Now, they were extremely heavy, but also what they had to do with them was bang them to settle the powder within the shells to make sure they were effective when they were fired. So if you didn't do it right, you were quite likely to blow not just your limbs off, but maybe kill yourself altogether. And of course, there was also the problem with certain forms of powder that it turned people with women's skin yellow, and that was a lifelong condition. Um, the women who were in the munitions factories throughout Ireland were mainly organised by the British based National Federation of Women Workers. Mary MacArthur was uh, a socialist who later became involved with labour politics, uh, national politics in England. But she 
brought that organization here. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it wasn't terribly popular because the Irish Women Workers Union and it was set up specifically to, you know, really to work with women workers. But because this was seen as a sort of temporary thing, the, none of the unions here were all that keen on um, in trying to recruit people who were not going to be around, you know, but once the war ended. The picture of the little Florence Lee there, uh, I've chosen it simply because um, when Florence was a dressmaker before the war and she was earning the princely sum of six shillings a week because she was an apprentice. And as a munitions worker with overtime, she could earn 48 shillings a week. But when it came to uh, the end of, it was actually before even the armistice, you know, this, in November 1918, the women were being let go and she was just abruptly thrown out with the rubbish you know that they recycled the machinery but the women who had worked in the machine on the machines couldn't be recycled because of course all the men were coming back from the forces and there wasn't going to be anywhere that they could work so these conditions as well, this is from a Dominion journalist visit to Ireland and it's documented on the Imperial War Museum website, but it shows some of the conditions that very young women were working on. For instance, the young woman there in the York Street spinning mill was only 14 and the Gallagher's tobacco factory, um, you know, that they were working in pretty unsavoury conditions and uh, the making trawler nets probably seemed fascinating to the journalists who were looking for them, but it was also notorious because the hemp would blow up and cause an awful lot of lung disease and other things. So unions were trying to get in to organise this, but uh, there was very strong resistance from, uh, I should say women's unions were trying to get in because they always had a very uh, kind of, the, the approach was always stronger on health and safety and pastoral issues than on actual pay. That it was the conditions that women were working on that they were most militant about. But Winnie Carney, as I said, was very involved with the textile operatives, but she really gave up on that to become uh, totally involved with the separatist movement as a member of the Irish Citizen Army. And she was in uh, the GPO in 1916. And she became involved in national politics for a little while afterwards, unsuccessfully, but she had very bad health, whether it was a result of all the hard slog that she had put in for a few years, I don't know, but she died quite early in 1914. Now, as I mentioned, the separation women, and really it was because of, as I said, the class attitudes that are very obvious from some of the uh, people who gave statements about their involvement in the revolutionary period. And they were so-called separation women because of the separation allowances that they got, which was often the difference between you know, starving or survival. Uh, the poster isn't very clear, I'm afraid, on the rates, but, you know, it went down through the numbers of children, so they could do reasonably well, plus perhaps, you know, money actually being sent back from a soldier's wages. And they said it was the difference between survival and not. But they were absolutely despised, and some of the attitudes that come through in the witness statements from nationalists, they disguised described them generally as the rabble. This echoed the sort of nonsense that came through uh, from middle class people that was, you know, most infamously in William Martin Murphy's Irish Independent newspaper, but talking about slum dwellers and poor people as the scum of the earth. And the, while there were certainly incidences I'm sure, you know, that if people got money they didn't have before, that they drank it. It wasn't universal, you know, that, but it was sort of, oh, they shouldn't be getting this money. They're selling out Mother Ireland for the English shilling and they're drinking it. And I think this extract from Geraldine Dillon's, it's not so much really, I mean, she wasn't by any means uh, the most vicious. In fact, she was fairly reasonable in her terminology, but she's talking about what uh, the separation allowance women 
were doing. Now, there's absolutely no evidence that they were separation allowance women, but uh, it kind of that the a correlation was being made between the fact that they were getting money from the British government and their survival. So, of course, when riots happened and people didn't behave well, or in this case, rather madly, with the woman with the scapular in her hand, uh, you know that that was equated with the people who lived in the slums, and it was, as I said, very much a reflection of the sort of thing that had been said during 1913. But I'm, I'm going to finish off really with the anti-conscription campaign from the Labour point of view, because Sonia's going to talk about it in more detail. But the trade union movement played a very strong role. Well, it was the Irish uh, Trade Union Congress and Labour Party at the time. And trade unions were very active in the anti-conscription movement when the um, Military Service Act was brought in and it was conscription was resisted here. And uh, the, in, there was a general strike organized by the Congress on the 23rd of April 1918. And there were stoppages throughout the country, but there was a pledge that was signed by the men and there was a pledge signed for the women. It's, you know, quite why it had to be different, I don't know. But essentially, um, you see there, even coming them on, which is that it was primarily, uh, a, lo a lot of their members were from a middle class background, but the terminology they used in the course of that was that uh, they, we, they wouldn't blackleg, they wouldn't... Uh, break strikes, you know, so that, and that they wouldn't take the jobs of men who were had been forced to enlist if they didn't win the conscription, the anti-conscription, which of course they did in the end. But the national pledge signed by the women, the, the absolutely largest contingent that of anybody that went, there were marches to various uh, places to sign the pledge on um, the weekend the, before the general strike. And there was a women's day uh, in various centres. And certainly the one in Dublin, the Irish Women Workers Union marched as a contingent. And it must have been about all of their uh, members because there were 2,400 women on it to sign it. And the next biggest was the Irish Tailoresses Union. So they really were putting themselves in the way of fighting conscription, but showing that they understood that there was an economic involvement as well and that there was an imperative there not to take a man's job but uh, because the whole system had to be changed not just uh, fighting the, the, the war by itself so that's me for now and I'll pass you over to Sarah thank you Great, okay, uh, thanks. So I'm going to basically cross over, I think, both papers actually in some in some bit of a way um, and lead on into some other areas because really what I want to talk about more so is um, the anti-conscription movement and also to actually look at how a little bit more, which Neve talked about, how women were actually used to recruit men um, into, the, into the British Army as well. And... So I'll just start off just where, you know, it's already been kind of mentioned, this idea of what's happening with women right up to. So I'm going to be looking at literally from the beginning of war in 1914. But really, we can't kind of underestimate what women have been doing politically up until this time. The suffragette movement at this stage has reached an absolute height of activity. We're talking about really raised militancy. We're talking about bombing campaigns, arson campaigns, right the way across England. Um, and just to kind of give you an example of some of them, um, that's the, the larger image is actually what was the tea house in Kew Gardens. So, you know, we're really talking about these images are coming up in British newspapers constantly at the time that there's women. So it, we're not just talking about women, you know, chaining themselves to railings, having public marches and um, setting letterboxes on fire. We're actually talking about really targeted um, bombing and arson campaigns, including even at one stage the Chancellor of the Exchequer's house, a soon to be house, David Lloyd George's house, 
um, which they attempted to bomb, but didn't didn't get too far with it, but still did a bit of damage. In Ireland, the uh, it's probably underestimated actually what's happening with the suffragettes at the time because it takes a little bit longer for the women in Ireland to take up such heightened militancy. But it is interesting that actually the very last suffragette bombing happened in Lisbon. And this happened as late as it was in the early hours of Saturday, the 1st of, Oct of August 1914. And suffragettes discharged dynamite outside of Christchurch Cathedral in the city. And they actually damaged the masonry work of the building and destroyed a 300-year-old stained glass window. And this is really kind of relevant as well, that it's, you know, the 1st of August. It's actually that that same day Germany declares war on Russia. A few days later, Britain declares war on Germany. So this is, you know, right up to the war effort that we've got women, um, women in Ireland active. The suffragettes, what's interesting as well when we look at them is that in Ireland and Britain, they had actually been united by one common goal, regardless of whether they differed under other opinions. So they've got one common goal of securing the votes for women. And that's something that they actually work together on. So we've got the suffragettes inviting people like Christabel Pankhurst over, who gives a talk in, um, in, in Dublin at the time in the Rotunda. Um, we've also got you know, suffragettes, even the division, even within the issue on the island of Ireland, even the things like home rule and whether women are feeling differently about home rule and ideas of home rule. In, in, for many people, it's actually put to one side because they've got this common goal of securing votes for women. And it is actually, this is evidenced by, which Neve mentioned earlier, this, the, the, this is the organ of, um, of the, the really the main suffragette organisation in Ireland. And Francis Sheehy Skeffington was editor at the time. And on the 15th of June in 1912, he actually puts this up. So this is to give you an idea what's happening before the war, because once war happens, this all changes. But his headlines, he proudly proclaims united Irish women, nationalist and unionist, militant and non-militant. But it's actually when the war breaks out, when war is declared, this changes, and this changes dramatically. And this is what I want to kind of look at as well, is how women have been used and how they're reacting differently to conscription in, in um, Britain, in Ireland, and within the island of Ireland as well. Days after the war was declared, there, there is a huge number of women that are imprisoned right the way across, mainly, uh, mainly in England, some in Ireland, not as many, but there's a huge amount of women imprisoned. Days after the war, the Home Secretary grants an amnesty and releases all of these women. And the reaction to even this is quite interesting because the suffragettes in England instantly drop their campaign and they support the war effort. In Ireland, the reaction is quite different and this um, front page has already been shown, but the, the issue here is as well that Francis Sheehy Skeffington within days publishes this emblazoned on the front page of the newspaper, votes for women now, damn your war. Um, and of course, we've got people like the Labour historian, Paura Yates, who says actually readers would have been more shocked by the use of the word damn rather than the sentiments at the time. But it gives us an idea that, you know, the, the Irish suffragettes, uh, certainly from the nationalist perspective, are instantly against the war. Even though Francis E. Skeffington himself is a pacifist, he's a committed nationalist. And we've got these different ideals coming across in the newspaper. But the women in England are actually not only supporting the war effort, but they actually start actively touring the country on these recruitment drives. Um, you've got the Pankhursts, who are the leaders of the suffragettes, really main organisation in England, actually calling for enforced conscription long before it's ever introduced, from the beginning. We've also got these, um, you know, pretty humiliating uh, tactics that are established by these women. One of them is called um, the White Feather, White Feather Brigade, women who will actually go out and look for men of military age on the street if they're not wearing a military uniform they will walk up and publicly humiliate them by presenting them with a white feather. So we've got these ideas of actually, you know, women are humiliating or inspiring men to go to war, one or the other. But we've also got women becoming key instigators, or sorry, I should show as well, there is some more of the propaganda campaigns as well, which, which Neve has also talked about. And it is this idea of, you know, in England, it's literally the women in Britain telling their men to go to war. 
But we've also got the implications of what happens if you don't man up, if you don't prove your masculinity, if you don't go and fight and protect the, the women folk especially. On the poster on the right, it's too late for this man now. And we've got the, you know, the German Huns at, at his door. And of course, we've got the representation of a woman, a child and an elderly person that he should have been out protecting. So what is these, these women are, are used as a central way of inspiring men to, to actually join the war. But we've also got women playing, becoming key instigators actually of the anti-war campaigns. And the Irish Women Nationalist Organisation, Eni Heron, do issue the, the um, poster that Mary mentioned about the warning of girls not to be seen walking through the streets with men wearing the uniform of Ireland's oppressor. But we've also got actually some women playing a key part in England against the war effort, some Irish women in England. And of course, I have to mention Eva Gore Booth. Um, and she becomes a central one. And she's an Irish poet a trade unionist, and she's the younger sister of Countess Markovic. I thought I'd show an image of, of Eva and Constance that you normally wouldn't see Eva or Constance. You'd normally see her in her Republican uniform toting her, toting her gun. But this is a picture of the sisters um, when they still lived in, in Ireland in Lizardell House. Um, Gore Booth's activities actually and her connection with the Republican movement through Markovic actually later end up influencing the anti-conscription campaign in Ireland as well. So we have these crossovers of women, <coughs> Irish women working in England and they influence this, um, what's happening in Ireland. Now, adopting a pacifist stance at the time in England is actually particularly defiant. You first of all, you've got in the beginning this kind of heightened anti-German sympathisers' feelings, you know, across across Britain, you know, spurred on by the propaganda, obviously as well. But you've also got, so you've got the risk of being labelled as a German sympathiser if you are anti-war. So these are these issues are a problem, and you've also got laws against it. You've got the Defence of the Realm Act, which strictly regulates people's behaviour during during World War One. So to to print leaflets against the war, to actively campaign against the war. I mean, Francis E. Skeffington falls foul of that, and he's arrested in, in Dublin for having anti-recruitment meetings. But in May 1915, when the threat of war extends beyond Europe with the sinking of the Lusitania, which is a passenger liner. That actually changes quite a lot as well. We've got a passenger liner torpedoed by a German U-boat on a route from New York to Liverpool. And it sinks off the coast of Kinsale. And the tragedy actually changes the, the public imagination in America because there's 124 American citizens on board. And this, of course, changes their, their I suppose, perception of what's happening with the war. But the tragedy also is used to incite anti-German feelings. And it's used by the British Council for Recruiting in Ireland. And they use images like this of, you know, showing women and children drowning off the coast of Ireland and very, you know, very clearly, directly Irish men avenge the Lusitania. And directly in the aftermath of this, it's, it's starting to build up in England. And Eva Gore Booth befriends two men who become key players in the anti-conscription movement, <coughs> Bertrand Russell and Fenner Brockway. And Brockway founds the No Conscription Fellowship, actually, at the beginning of the war, with this idea that possibly, possibly, there is going to be enforced conscription. And the idea of this is to provide protection for men who don't want to fight in the war, whether it's on moral, religious or political grounds. But the war by this stage, by the Lusitania, has been raging for just only a year um, and it's already claimed an enormous loss of life. And there is a huge problem that the, there, there's so many men being killed and maimed at the front and they're simply not being replaced quickly enough. So in England, we, we need to kind of track what's happening in Britain to see you know, how we end up with this anti-conscription crisis in Ireland later on. They take a national register in Britain and it reveals that there's two million eligible men, so of fighting age, who haven't actually volunteered for the army at that stage. And this just compounds the idea of, of you know, conscripting them. And it's brought in in Britain for the first time in, British, in modern British history, they have enforced conscription into the army. And that comes into effect on the 2nd of March, 1916. And Ireland doesn't have a mention at this stage in the conscription bill.
There are provisions made for individual exemptions, and these are, are really challenging. They set up all these tribunals across Britain, and men can say, yes, that they're conscientious objectors. They can put their case forward in front of a tribunal. And if we think about the tribunals are actually run by people, by men, um, but clearly th these are the only ones with political power at the time. So it's run by men who are generally older men, middle class men, who are fervent supporters of the war. So it's very difficult to put your case across in front of them. If a man fails to gain an exemption in front of this tribunal and still refuses to take up war service, he faces a court martial and ultimately a prison sentence. That they don't actually exclude the death sentence, though they never actually enforce that on the conscientious objectors. But the high level of arrests of the male members of the No Conscription Fellowship means that women become a really intrinsic part of the movement. They aren't getting jailed at the time. And they run a really highly organised press department. And it's really to travel the country, and we have women like, and we have a number of Irish women involved in this, and Eva Gore Booth travels the country, sits in on these tribunals, and literally records what's happening. So what is being said to the conscientious objectors, what charges they've got. Otherwise, nobody knows. Nobody even knows who these men are because there, there, there isn't a high profile about them. And she writes, um, which is particularly interesting that she, she writes and publishes a pamphlet that's absolutely scathingly condemning the tribunal system. And she maintains in it that they're held before six ignorant men and blind. So it's all very clear what, what the tribunal, uh, what, the, what the pamphlet is about. It's a blatant condemnation. And it's actually a very brave move for her to publish this pamphlet. And she publishes it in June 1916. Bertrand Russell himself was arrested for authorship of a similar, similar pamphlet. But if you think Gorbuth is open to even worse repercussions. She's published the pa pamphlet very shortly after the Easter Rising. And the Easter Rising is viewed with intense hostility by people in Britain because it's really seen that it's the ungrateful Irish who are rising up and fighting against British soldiers while all of these British soldiers are, are being killed at the front. So we've got extreme hostility. Um, it's also at the time we have a personality file is held on Markovich and Gore Booth by British intelligence in Dublin Castle. And they record everything. They record the visits that uh, Gore Booth is making to her sister. Everything is literally recorded by prison wardens in the vicinity and written down and held in the Dublin Castle. She's also associated with the nationalist movement and she has just launched a really intense, highly international prolific campaign against the rep or for the reprieve of Roger Casement's death sentence. And of course, if we remember, Casement himself has been arrested while attempting to liaise with a German boat loaded with 20,000 rifles um, from Germany to help the Easter Rising. So clearly, you know, Gore Booth can be seen instantly as a German sympathiser from that perspective. But while we have um, so many members of the men at being arrested with the No Conscription um, Fellowship, Brockway is actually imprisoned four times during the course of the war. And during this stage, he has worked very closely with Gore Booth, who actually instills in him a sense of uh, Irish, Irish nationalism, that he supports the Irish nationalist cause. And during his last incarceration, he is locked up in Lincoln Prison with no less than Eamon de Valera during the time of when we're coming into the anti-conscription um, or the conscription issue in Ireland. So we've got, although I can't prove, we certainly know that de Valera is an associate of Eva Gore Booth, so is Brockway, who she's clearly working very closely with. Um, and these similar anti-conscription ideas start going through to de Valera uh, at this stage. And if we look at what happens with the conscription movement in Ireland, since the onset of war, We've got the recruitment of Irish men into the British Army was, of course, a really contentious issue. There's various tactics employed. The German invasion of Belgium, which Neve spoke about already, is actually used very cleverly, I think, in some ways by the recruiting, by the British Recruiting Council. It's, it's this idea that, you know, they look to Belgium because Belgium, they describe really as a very similar country to Ireland. It's small, it's Catholic. It's got all of these things that Irish men should be able to relate to. Um, we've also got 
even the discussion of the way the invasion of Belgium is termed in gender terms, it's called the rape of Belgium. We've got these horrible media reports of horrific details of stories of women killed, tortured and raped by German soldiers. So we've got these ideas of asking, you know, asking Irish men. Again, the one on the right is clearly playing into the whole masculinity again. It's, you know, a man out for a walk with a shillelagh under his arm. It's the woman who's got the rifle and it's basically, you know, for the love of God, you know, do I have to go over and, and, and do this? Do I have to protect the women of Ireland? Um, so it's really playing in. And even the stance of him and the stance of her, it's, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of playing on this idea of, of man up. Um, where have I gone now? But before the war as well, we've got John Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party is gaining real ground at Westminster. And this becomes, John Redmond, of course, becomes a key issue in the whole recruitment. Home Rule for Ireland was actually passed in 1914, but due to the outbreak of war, it's never implemented. So we've got this, you know, something, this carrot being held over the nationalists in Ireland that it's, it's you know, it's nearly there. And Redmond pledges the members of the Irish volunteers would join the British Army. And as we know, thousands of them do, and they answer the call. Recruitment parades such as this one in, this is one in Dublin, a recruitment parade for the Royal Dublin, the Royal Fusiliers in 1915, happened quite regularly at the time. And we have over 200,000 Irish men join the British Army during World War I. But the government still want more. The British government want more Irish men. So in March 1918, and of course hindsight's a wonderful thing, we weren't to know, they weren't to know at that stage the war is nearly over. March 1918, the Irish Convention was established to resolve the Irish Home Rule issue. And they recommend the enactment of the bill under condition that conscription would be extended to Ireland. So we've got clear conditions. Home Rule will be enacted, but we're extending conscription. So on the 16th of April, they tried to extend the military service bill, which will enforce men of between that military going age into the British Army. Members of the Irish Parliamentary Party find this has gone a step too far, and they walk out of Westminster in protest. And a meeting is held in the Lord Mayor of Dublin's residence, and the Irish Anti-Conscription Committee is then formed. The committee develops the pledge which Mary spoke about, and the Catholic bishops agree that this pledge can be signed outside of Mass the next Sunday, the 21st of April. And this is a, a picture taken from the Irish Capuchin Journal for men queuing actually outside of the church to sign the pledge that they will not join the British Army. By the 23rd of April, which Mary mentioned, we've got a strike. And quite click, quickly, because there's all this resistance and this really, you know, Republican organisation against conscription in Ireland, British intelligence surprisingly uncover a Sinn Féin plot with Germany. Of course, there is no such thing. It's all just a, you know, a ruse. But it means that they can actually um, arrest and do arrest 73 leading rem members of the Republican movement without trial and they're sent to prison in, in Britain. Markovich herself, Gore Booth's sister, is arrested as part of this. And she describes the whole idea of this German plot as a comic opera, in her words. Um, but British authorities underestimate the reaction of Irish women, I think. And with the arrest of, again, many of the male key members, it's women, again, who become the key players in the Irish anti-conscription movement. Coming on, the Women's Nationalist Organisation which were formed, of course, to support the Irish volunteers, hold a meeting on the 27th of April. And the women quickly organise a mass opposition to conscription. The Irish Women's Franchise League again step into action. And Mary spoke about this. And I think this is actually a really clear tactic, or clever tactic, because when they say this, you know, conscription, no man must take, or no woman must take a man's job. What, what we really need to kind of look at is the idea that conscription could never have been enforced in Britain had women not stepped up and taken the role of worker. They had to run, it wasn't just munitions, it was running the country, it was ploughing the fields, it was driving the trams, it was doing everything that the men had left and, and they had been doing. But of course, also what's happening across Britain is 
that men, the men that are left on the home front, resent this and resent this really badly of women going into the workplace. They're concerned that women, because they will accept lower wages in certain occupations, that actually after the war, that though they know the war is going to end at some stage, that women are going to saturate the job market, that women are going to maybe under, uh, underscore their wages. So there is a retaliation in, in Britain against the female workforce. And I think it's very clever tactic, actually, that the, the Irish women um, take with this idea that they're playing into this. Um, and this idea that no man, no woman should take a man's job. We've also got other more forcible accounts, actually. And for one of the, the interesting ones is reactions that Gore Booth herself decides that she will actually start influencing in England what's happening. And she writes to the British newspapers. And one of her letters is, is entitled The Ruin Preparing in Ireland. And it's published in the Manchester Guardian. And it receives much attention. And she opens her letters with these determined assurances that in Dublin, a resistance to the death is being undertaken in a spirit of passionate revolt and religious faith, which may turn Ireland into a nation of rebels and martyrs, but never into an army of conscripts. And she describes how women workers are pledging themselves, again, um, as Mary was talking about, not to take the place of a man who is conscripted. But in order to animate this and to get this across, and she does get her point across in England as well, she, she um, describes a letter that she has received from a woman in Ireland. And I'll just read you the, the letter before I finish up on this. And this is what's published in the Manchester Guardian. I am a farmer. I have farmed land all my life. And your government demanded compulsory tillage and compuls compulsory military service. That means that women must till the land. We will not do it. If my brother is taken, he will not be taken alive and I shall be left with farm and stock, so I will do this. Neither crops nor cattle shall go to you. I will kill the stock. I will destroy the crop if I have to dig it up by the roots with my hands, and then I will take my rifle. I've used a rifle all my life, and I will take it, and I will go out, and I will fight, and I will die. And this receives reaction quite quickly. And we have instantly a letter from a man in Surrey responding. Now, remember, this is in British newspapers, quite widely read British newspapers at the time. And one man from Surrey says, well, this compels all thoughtful men and women to pause. We English people want, above all things, to win the war. And we ask ourselves whether conscription of Ireland against her will is not the way to lose it. We may deplore Ireland's actions, but we cannot ignore it. And the conscription crisis drags on. And in June 1918, the main female organisation organises a rally on the 9th of June on the feast of St. Colm Kill. And despite British efforts, forced conscription of Irish men into the British Army is never introduced. Now, we do, of course, have to take into account that America and her have joined Britain and her allies in, um, in the war effort in 1917. But really, Markovich kind of sums up the Irish belief of what's happened. And she writes to her sister and maintains that it wasn't talk that blocked conscription. It was the astounding fact that the whole male population left at home and most of the women would have died rather than fight for England. And they simply dare not exterminate a nation. Thanks very much.